So the title of today's message is, What is the meaning of thanksgiving to you? What is the meaning of thanksgiving to you? Now as we have just celebrated another thanksgiving this week, did you think about any of the blessings that God has given you during this time period? Did you praise God for what He has done for you in another year? Do you ever think back through your lives at any time in the past or any thanksgivings in the past? Are there any past thanksgivings that stand out more than others in your life? As children in school, we learned about the pilgrims coming over here in the, on the Mayflower in 1620 so that they could have a better life and escape the dictatorship and the persecution of the Church of England, which was basically the same as the Catholic Church. So does the Bible say anything specifically about thanksgiving or giving thanks? Of course it does. Of course, it, it's all through our Bibles, right? All right, so we're going to jump right into our text. If you'd like to stand one more time, then I'll let you sit down for about 30 minutes. <laughs> all right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear precious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you once again, Lord, and I pray, Lord God, that you would just, uh, Lord, bless this service, bless this message, loosen my lips, loosen my jaws, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you'll anoint the ears of everyone here, Lord, that they'll hear the message, Lord, that you want them to hear, the message that they need to hear, Lord. And I pray, Lord God, that this message will answer questions that they may have in their lives, Lord. I pray that you'll just bless this service. Bless me, Lord. Help me, Lord, to... Do your will, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated. You can tell I'm rusty. I mean, I've done that part before I've you know, done the text. So anyway, we're going to do the text, and you've got your prayer all in front. Yeah, it's been a while, hasn't it? All right. So today, our text will begin with Ephesians chapter 5. Now we've got, I think, about five different texts here that we're going to look at, four or five, and, uh, but they're small, so we won't stay in them very long. But I want you to just follow along with me very closely. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20, NLT all day today. It says, And give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7 says, And now, just as you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord, you must continue to follow Him. Let your roots grow down into Him, and let your lives be built on Him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught, and you will overflow with thankfulness. Colossians chapter 3 verse 17 says, And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to Him, to God, through Him, to God the Father. Psalms 28 7 says, The Lord is my strength and my shield. I trust, in, I trust Him with all my heart. He helps me and, he, and my heart is filled with joy. I burst out in songs of thanksgiving. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Don't forget that part. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. In my life, I remember our economy in this country when things were good, and I'm sure you do too. And there were plenty of jobs, and food and fuel prices were low, and interest rates were good. I mean, those good old days. Then I've seen times where there was no jobs to get, interest rates were through the roof, and just like it is now in the past, there's been times when food and fuel prices were through the roof. It's like this country and countries around the world are on or hooked up to a heart machine like this picture here shows. One year it's up and then it starts going down. Then in a few years it's back up again. Will anybody agree with me on that? Everybody? I mean, it's been like that all of our lives, right? There's a reason for that. We're going to find out the reason here in a minute. I mean, think about it. 
how would it be if those heart lines in our world today, if those heart lines just stayed a little above center and things just leveled off and there was always plenty of jobs, everything was plentiful, and people had the one thing that not many people has today and that is a thing called extra money at the end of the month. Anybody agree with me on that one? Okay? Especially nowadays. All right? Wouldn't it be great to have that again? Now, I know what you're thinking. Probably. It's the first thing that popped into my mind when I was getting this. If that line levels off on a heart machine, someone just died, right? Okay? Right. All right. But here's something else I want you to think about. If humans had never disobeyed God, there would be no heart machines. None whatsoever. There wouldn't be no heart machines. There would be no big pharma to take all your money. There would be no hospitals. There would be no graveyards. Because there would be no death if we had not have disobeyed God. So what brought all this on? God lifting his hand of protection for the human disobedience that took place in the garden. Apparently, Adam and Eve was not thankful for everything that God had gave them. Why? Why? Because they wanted more. They wanted more. And here's the proof of that. Genesis chapter 3 verses 4 and 5 says, You won't die, the serpent replied. Of course, that's Satan speaking through this certain serpent. You won't die. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat of it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. I guess having everything in the world at their fingertips suddenly wasn't good enough for them. Wasn't good enough for them. They wanted more. We tend to still be like that, don't we? We can have the whole world and we still want more, don't we? We still want more. So with that in mind, did God give Adam and Eve control of their own destiny? Yes. Do we have control of our own destiny today? Right now. Now think about that before you answer it. But the answer is, yes, we do. We have control of our own destiny. Now, how is that? Because we have a choice whether we, can, whether we want to serve God or whether we want to serve Satan. Because there's no in-between. If you're not serving God, you are serving Satan. We control our own destiny. We do not have to serve Satan. We can serve God. So we can control it. How many of you have ever wondered why God allows us to have hard times in our lives? Anybody? Anybody? Like we've had for the last couple of years. And other times when things have even been a lot worse. How many of you would like to know the answer to that question? Anybody? Anybody? Well, I tell you what, I'm going to tell you. It's only going to cost you $29.95. Just come on up, all right? Oh, wait a minute. I keep forgetting we're not a mega church, and I'm not a prosperity gospel preacher, so it's all free here today, all right? Got to do something. Y'all need y'all eat too much turkey the last few days. You got to get y'all wakened up a little bit here, all right? So here's the answer. It's all about thanksgiving. It's all about thanksgiving. Or as the Bible says, giving thanks to God. That's what it's all about. All Christians should agree that this has definitely been a year of 2 Chronicles 7.14. The year 2024 has definitely been the year of 2 Chronicles 7.14. And that is quickly becoming my, one of my favorite verses. I've got so many favorites. They're stacking on top of each other now. But let me read this to you. It says, and this is God doing the speaking here. Then if my people, who's my people? His people, all right? Okay. Now listen to what else it says. 
Then if my people who are called by my name. What's, what's Jesus' name? Jesus and what? Christ. Christ Jesus. What are we called? Christians. So he's telling. This is Chronicles a long time before Christians ever was such a thing. A long time before the new birth and all of that. So if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will restore their land. So only Christians can say this prayer and get any results, right? You know why? Here's the proof. If you're not a born again Christian, you can pray to God all you want to unless the Holy Spirit has made a connection. And that's that drawing of the Holy Spirit. Like when you get under conviction and you come to the altar. That drawing is the first, that's the connection that's made between you and God. But if you're lost and you pray to God, you might as well pray to this block wall because you're not going to get anywhere. It's not going anywhere. It has to go through the Holy Spirit. And we're going to talk about that more just in a few minutes. So how do we give thanksgiving to God? How do we do that? Well, the word said in our text in Colossians 2, 6 through 7, And now, just as you have accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow Him. How many people have I prayed with over the past 30 years that has come to church maybe to a revival or whatever, and I've prayed with them or somebody else has prayed with them, they get born again and then you don't ever see them again. And then they wonder why their life's not any better. And the reason is you must continue to follow Him. You have to get in a relationship with God. Verse 7 says, Let your roots grow down deep into Him. Now, most of the Bible, and especially the New Testament, are examples that is being used to try to show people something in their life. So what he's talking about here, let your roots grow down deep in Him, and let your lives be built on Him. What does that mean? That means if a tree grows on shallow dirt, and there's rock behind it, or below it, and those roots can't grow down deep and a good windstorm comes over, it's going to blow it over because it doesn't have any depth, right? So this is the illustration he's telling us. We have to grow deep, grow down deep in Christ. If you've got good soil and a tree grows deep roots, the wind can't hardly blow it over. So it's telling you, look out, you got trouble coming here. You better be strong or you won't, you won't stand up to the test. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. There's that word again, thankfulness. Then also in our uh, text, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 18, it says, Always be joyful. Now, there's just three words there. Always be joyful. How in the world can we always be joyful in the world that we live in today? I want you to think about that just a minute. How can we always be joyful? Things don't go right every day, right? Sometimes we have ups, sometimes we have downs, sometimes we have sickness, sometimes we have family members that pass away. But it's saying, always be joyful. You know why? Because if you've got the Lord Jesus Christ in your hearts, you've got something to be joyful for. Because this world is nothing but a dressing room. This is a preparation room for the next life. Always be joyful. And then in verse 17 it says, never stop praying. How can, how can we go through life and never stop praying? You ever, you ever wondered about that? How do you do that? Other translation says, pray without ceasing. Now, you know, that would have been hard to understand or hard to make an illustration for people several years ago. But right now, we've, let me give you a really good illustration of this. Here it is. How many of you ever used the little Bluetooth earpieces that's got the little boom or anything in there? Anybody? Well, I use them quite often, okay? Because they're very handy, especially when I'm on the road. So I don't have to touch my phone. I can just lay my phone over to the side or whatever. If I've got that in my ear and I need to call somebody, I'll just say, hey, Siri. And she pops up, okay? And I can say, I'm going to turn it upside down because I don't want her calling nobody. 
But I can say call, I'm just going to say Joe Blow because he's not in my telephone. But I can say call whoever and it pops up and they call, right? Okay? That phone and that earpiece is kind of like the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit's in you, you have a direct connection with God. You are constantly connected with God. Never forget that. Because no matter what you do, He is with you, right? Okay? So we have that connection. Now, several years ago, a good friend of mine, and I may have told this story before, I don't know. A good friend of mine, we were in church down in, in uh, Greensburg, and we were in uh, uh, a class that we had on Tuesday night. And we'd done it every Tuesday night. And we re- kind of like our Wednesday night classes uh, are, we get pretty deep. And uh, we were on prayer. And I, by the way, I'm going to be doing some messages on prayer before too awful long. But we were on prayer. And he said, this guy, his name was Terry, lived over at Campbellsville. And he said, you know, he said, my dad and I, we have a real good relationship. He said, I can talk to him about anything. If I need anything, I call him. If he needs anything, he calls me. And he said, you know, he said, we, we're just that close. And he said, I want my relationship with God to be that close. And he said, you know, he said, I call him daddy. And I thought, really? <laughs> But, you know, and I got to thinking about that and I thought, wow, what a great relationship you can have with God that you can call him daddy. And he said, I call him daddy. He said, I talk to him all the time. So, you know what? When we pray, we don't always have to get down on our hands and knees and pray. We can pray going down the road. We can can talk to him anytime we want to. It says pray without ceasing. Don't ever stop talking to him. Don't ever stop praying. Always be there. Now, it's really good to get down on your hands and knees and to pray because you're showing worship to God. You're showing praise to God. And that's something I don't think anybody does enough is show praise and worship to God and thankfulness to God. A lot of times we kind of take that for advantage. Verse 18 says, Be thankful in all circumstances. So that kind of goes along with always being joyful, doesn't it? Be thankful in all circumstances. Because you know what? When we look at our circumstances, we look at them and we may be thinking, I don't know how I could handle any more. God may have just kept you from being in a circumstance a, a whole lot worse than the one you're in now. We don't know what He guides us away from. We don't know how many times that we've been going down the road and some drunk was on the road or somebody wasn't paying attention or somebody was playing with one of these things and they was going to swerve into you that he didn't yank the wheel back so we don't know what all God does for us we don't so we should be thankful in all circumstances there's a plan out there God uh, he, he said he'd meet all of our needs what are we worried about be thankful to him be thankful to him for we belong to Christ Jesus Now, it's easy for all of us to be thankful. I mean, when things are good and things is going our way, it's really easy. It's easy to be thankful for that. But our deformed, evil nature that we are born with, we didn't ask for it. We were born with it because of Adam and Eve. We've talked about that a lot. It causes us to get comfortable, right? I mean, if everything's going good in our lives... It's not long. I mean, I do it. A lot of people I know do it. You may not do it, but a lot of times we get so comfortable, we get complacent. We take our eyes off of God. We feel like, hey, we've got it going on now, right? We've got it going on. We don't have anything going on, folks. We really don't. It's God. It's God. But we get comfortable very, very quickly. And we take our minds off of God. What did Colossians 2.6 say? It says we must continue to follow Him. We must continue to follow Him. Always. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 16, 17 said, Always be joyful. Never stop praying. I just want to rerun these. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances. And we need to be thankful and praise God even when that heart machine is, not only when that heart machine is going up, but even when it's bottoming out. 
Now, I want you to think about something. And you may think I'm political, but that's, that's fine. But the last couple of years, anyone with any common sense could see the writing on the wall. You remember back in Daniel when, uh, what's his name, has <laughs> seen the writing on the wall? Okay, that's what I'm talking about. We could see the writing on the wall. Things were not looking good at all in this country and looked like it was going to get worse. And I believe that Christians here in America had went to spiritual sleep about five years ago. Things were good. <clears throat> we got complacent. We went to sleep spiritually. And now, when things get bad, we have finally woke up. Okay? And it's time to shove the woke agenda out. Alright? Woke up and woke them out. So we started praying. Us Christians. We started praying. We started calling out to God for help once again. Because when we get in trouble, we talk to God, right? Sometimes God has to let us get in trouble so He can hear from us. Right? We started calling out for God, to God once again. God in His goodness has come to the rescue once again, has He not? He's come to it once again. We should be praising Him. We should be extremely, because He is so extremely patient with us. We, just, we should be praising Him. I mean, no one else would ever be that patient. He puts up with our crying and our whining and our everything, and He comes to the rescue over and over again. Amen, anybody? Amen. All right. Now I want you to think about what God has done in this past year. When it comes to our next president, God has spared his life at least two times that we know about. Could be more, but at least two times. He's done that. That was God. God is putting him back in office against all odds as Satan's minions okay, have brought face, fake and false lawsuits against him multiple indictments with a very crooked, hand-selected, very biased jury that even found him guilty on some of these fake and false charges in New York. What a bunch of satanic scum they were. Okay, That's all you can call them, satanic scum. There is simply no way any man, period, on earth could go through all of that by himself, including Trump, without God having his hand on him. There's no way. There's no way. Trump, you know, the, the day of the election, the week of the election, oh, this race is just razor thin. Nobody knows who's going to win. A lot of people were banking on Kamala winning. Oh, we just, it's just so razor thin. Let me tell you something. Trump didn't just barely win the election. He dominated the election along with God's other chosen ones that took over the House of Representatives and the Senate. Amen. Okay? Giving God, God's people control of our government once again. Okay? He's come to the rescue and has given it back to us once again. We should be jumping up and down with joy and praise and thanksgiving to God right now. I don't know about you, but as bad of last couple of weeks as I've had, I, for the last three and a half weeks, I have woke up with a whole new renewed hope of what it's going to be like for the next three, four, five years. I mean, it's, it's actually, it's been wonderful. It's been wonderful to do that. I'm telling you, it has been wonderful. What a relief it's been to wake up and know that we're going to have a good economy again. We're going to have peace. We're going to have stability. But think about this. If God's people would just stay in close fellowship with God and not get complacent again, we could possibly possibly see J.D. Vance come into office in four years. And he may stay in for another four after that. 
And you may be thinking, well, why would we even want to do that? I'm ready to go up in the rapture and I'm ready to go home to heaven. So why in the world we want to do that? There's only one reason. Every one of us has got lost family members, lost friends that they need a little more time. And maybe, just maybe, we can pray for them. Maybe, just maybe, things will get bad enough in their life that God can get their attention. Or they might wake up and listen just a little bit. You know what? If I had my choice, if God were to come right now and He said, He said, Mark, you want to go home today or you want to wait another year or two? It would be hard for me not to say, let's go right now. It'd be hard. Because I know what the prize is on that side. And I know what it's going to be like here. It's going to be up or down. It's going to be bouncing around. So it would be hard. It's going to be hard. In the last three and a half weeks since the election, I have heard many, many people say they didn't think Trump would ever make it to office because somebody would kill him. And I'm like, really? What God has done, those bullets passing by his ear, I think God allowed that one to hit his ear so people on the CNN and MSNBC and all them wouldn't say, but those bullets didn't even get close to his head or anywhere else. And of course they would. But if one hit, their, it hit his ear, it kind of proved, you know what? You know, it's a wonder they didn't say, oh, somebody shot him with a BB gun. That's all that was. Because they're that, I'm not going to say stupid. They're not stupid. They're just crooked. They're just crooked. And then I've heard other ones say, yep, Trump's never going to get in office. The Dems going to start a war. Well, let me tell you something. They, they're trying really hard right now to start a war. They'll start a war with another country and they'll postpone Trump from getting into office. <laughs> and sure enough, Biden's handlers or handler, whoever's running this show, because he certainly isn't running it, the one or ones that really control the government, guess what? They told Biden, call President Zelensky over in Ukraine and tell him to go ahead and start shooting long-range missiles in toward, his, or toward Russia and we'll back you, we'll take care of you. Why on earth would anybody do that? These crackpots would because they want to do anything they can do to destroy Trump's presidency if he gets in or try to keep him out of office one way or another. And I'm not trying to be political. I'm telling you what God is doing here is God is in control of things. Okay? He's in control of things. So what did Zelensky do after they told him to do that? He, he, done, the, he done it. Okay? And most officials and most people that's in government are looking at it pretty wild right now. And, and they're looking at it and say, you know what? This could actually start World War III. And it very well could. Very well could. So those people are not ever to be trusted again. We need to always make sure of that. So it would not surprise me if they didn't continue to try to kill Trump. That wouldn't surprise me a bit. It wouldn't surprise me if they did go ahead and try to get World War III started because that's just the way they are. They're on Satan's team over here. They're playing football for the wrong team because they don't want Trump to take office at all. And remember, this is a battle not between Democrats and Republicans. It's really not. It is a battle between good versus evil. Good versus evil. And here's the problem. Our people in this country and around the world are taking up sides. They're not playing middle ground anymore. They're going hard left, or, well, yeah, hard left your side. Hard right, okay? They're either, they're either following God or following Satan. And they're taking up sides right now. And it's, I believe that's worse than I've ever seen it. But I don't believe that any of this will work this time. Because God has answered the prayers of the Christians, of God's people. And God has protected Trump through all that mess. And the prayers were answered. Amen. No way around that. So give God praise and thanksgivings. Give Him praise and thanksgivings. The praise and thanksgivings that He deserves. What God has done is also fulfilling Bible prophecy. Now I believe, and you know what I say about I believe all the time. 
do your own research. Because Mark, I'm sure I get about as much wrong as I do right, probably. So I believe God is getting everything in place for His return. To rapture His church out. As you've heard me say over the last year or so, peace and economic times must be good throughout the world just like it was in Noah's day before Jesus will come and get His bride, the church. It's got to be good. It will be when no one will be expecting it to take place. People always start thinking about the rapture taking place when the economy gets bad and everything just falls, goes to pot. That's when they start to, oh, I believe the rapture is going to take place. I believe God's going to come rescue me out. Well, He is in one sense of word before the tribulation, but you know what? That's not the way it's going to be. You're going to be moseying around through life. I think God, God is going to be looking at you and He's going to be watching you because you're not going to be expecting this. And He's going to look at you and He's going to see where your true heart's at. Where are you going to be when things get good again? Are you going to be focused on God or are you going to be focused on yourself? Or are you going to be focused on your stuff? Or how much money we can make? Because we'll probably all, we'll probably all make more money next year and the next year than we have in the last two or three. I hope everybody does. But we've got to keep our focus on God. Because he's coming to get his bride. He's coming to get his bride. About five or six years ago would have been a real good time for him to come and get his bride. We had peace all over the world. It was a real good time. So we've got to be careful and not get complacent. But there's something else to keep in mind in these verses that we read about. In the Bible, in Genesis chapter 6, verses 2 through 5, it tells us the way, things, the way things were in the time of Noah. Not only the good times, it also gives us another clue. And you have to look for clues when you're trying to figure something out in the Bible. And it gives us a clue as to how the things will be right before the rapture. We know that before the flood, the fallen angels that fell, that they were stuck in that tree, of knowledge of good and evil. That was a prison to them. Mankind, Adam and Eve, released them from the tree. Had they not have released them from the tree, they'd still be in the tree. But those fallen angels were with Satan. I do believe that. And they was also referred to as the sons of God in Genesis chapter 6. Those fallen angels were apparently, I'm glad we've got children's church, about what I'm getting ready to say, those fallen angels were apparently breeding anything and everything that walked. Women were having massive babies by them that grew up to be giant Nephilites or hybrids, if you will. Also from history, we see the carvings and the writings and drawings on the caves and stuff like that. All of the part animal, humanoid looking creatures. A lot of those things were worshipped by different cultures over the years. That was a result of those fallen, those sons of God, those fallen angels mating with animals, bestiality. In verse 5 Genesis of Genesis chapter 6, we read, The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and He saw everything that they thought, or imagine was constantly or consistently evil, totally evil. In the time of Lot, it shows us more of this picture. Just as the good times, it also shows us sexual perversion, homosexuality, and sodomy was running rampant in Sodom and Gomorrah. This is actually where the word sodomy is said to have originated from, from Sodom. And because of that, God destroyed them all. So in those two events, God destroyed the world with a global flood, and then later He destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah with fire because of sexual perversion. So let me ask you a question. 
Why in the world would we possibly think for one minute that God would put up with the sexual perversion, transgenderism, and homosexuality in the world we have going on today? Why would we even possibly think that? What's different now than it was in Sodom and Gomorrah or in the world before the flood? What's different? Not much. Not much. So we shouldn't even think that God's not going to come down on this earth and and clean house. As soon as He takes us out in the rapture, His hand of protection will be lifted. It goes up with the Holy Spirit. His hand of protection will be lifted. And that will usher in the start of the tribulation. That don't start the tribulation. You've heard us talk before. It's about three and a half years before the tribulation starts. But that starts the process. The flood in Sodom and Gomorrah will look like a picnic in comparison to what tribulation will be like. The Bible says that it will be the worst time in the history of the world. Worst time that's ever been. After destroying the world, this is going to be the worst time. Tribulation. But you know what? This is where you ought to get excited. As Christians, our future is bright and shiny. Bright and shiny. You know why? Because we win. We win. No matter what happens, we Christians, we win. We win. Jump up and down. It's time to be thankful unto God. The Thanksgiving celebration should always be focused on God and not turkey and dressing dinner. Okay? Focus on God. So this morning we need to pray, we need to praise, and we need to thank God for all that He has done. You agree? Then stand up. Get a song of invitation.